Welcome to the Adventure Overland exhibit in the Richard Varner Gallery at the Peterson Museum. My name is Paul Dorleans. I'm the curator. This is my fourth exhibit curated at the Peterson Museum. This exhibit explores the spirit of adventure in the past and the present and the future. We've got a collection of off-world vehicles. We've got a collection of sci-fi vehicles, vehicles that went around the world, motorcycles and cars. It's pretty impressive and exciting collection. This exhibit was produced by the Motorcycle Arts Foundation and Sasha Cherevkov. Uh, it was supported by Harley Davidson and assembled by my hardworking team at Vintage and Lab. Uh, you can see the full story of everything we're going to talk about on the Peterson uh, website or at thevintagent.com where we have stories of each of these vehicles and films and photographs. One of the stars of our show is this incredible 1933 Puk 250SL that was ridden by Max Reich uh, from Austria to India, which doesn't sound that dramatic now, but at the time it was the first vehicle that had ever gone overland uh, from Europe to India. The route had only been rediscovered in the early 1900s by an archeologist who dug into historical texts to find this path and Reich worked with the Pook company who made a very customized motorcycle. And you can see this bike is basically as ridden back then. He, uh, after he finished this the, the ride, he stored it away. It's been displayed for years at a private museum in Austria. And this is the first time this bike has ever been seen in the United States. The patina is remarkable. The equipment is remarkable. The story is remarkable. Reich wrote a book about it called India, the Shimmering Dream. Uh, he followed up this exercise in 1936 by going around the world in a Steyr Pook. And uh, he was quite the adventurer. And this particular motorcycle really celebrates everything Adventure Overland is about. It's just an embodiment of the spirit of adventure. Adventure Overland not only celebrates real world activities on Earth, it celebrates achievements in outer space. Uh, the concept of overlanding means traveling over land. And these two vehicles are models of Mars rovers from JPL. And uh, we have Sojourner and Opportunity. And Opportunity actually holds the record currently for the longest off-world overland travel. I think it's something like 36 miles, and uh, which may seem like not so much, but when you consider the difficulty of traveling a few million miles away from Earth, it's quite an achievement. Uh, we're super lucky to have these models. We really thank JPL and NASA for providing them. And they're a fabulous contrast to the sci-fi exhibits we have, which are how we imagine off-world overland travel would be. Well, this is the reality. And except for the uh, lunar rovers, uh, this is what we're doing right now on Mars. It's gonna be a while yet before we get human beings on Mars in vehicles. This remarkable and awkward trike is a replica of a trike that participated in the very first Peking to Paris rally in 1907. That rally was a call to the motoring industry to prove that cars and, and trikes were viable vehicles for travel. So they dreamed up an idea of a rally 9,000 miles long from Peking to Paris. And a Cantal trike, Mototri it was called, participated. They found incredible hardship on the roads. I mean, there were no roads. Uh, eventually, it got stuck in Mongolia. The two riders were lucky to get out alive because they were in the Gobi Desert. And, uh, Anton Gonnison in 2019 was a regular participant in the revived Peking to Paris rally. And he thought, you know, as a, as a Belgian, he thought I should really try this <laughs> with the original Cantal trike. Anton was not able to find an authentic 1906 Cantal. They're treasured and ultra rare vehicles. So he actually ended up buying the Cantal name and making his own. It's slightly updated. It has a BMW engine and much more modern wheels, but the general arrangement is the same. The poor passenger had to sit up there unprotected and he rode here. He said the vibration was such that he couldn't feel his hands for weeks after the rally, but uh, he successfully completed the ride over 9,000 miles on this exposed trike. 
This remarkable vehicle was Robert Edison Fulton Jr.'s Douglas Mastiff, 1932. Uh, that he wrote around the world and wrote about in a very famous book called One Man Caravan. He actually carried a cinema camera with him and he filmed his exploits as well by himself. His story is incredible. Uh, it's really one of the foundational texts of overland literature because uh, Fulton was a very sensitive man and talked a lot about just human habits that he encountered around the world. He. Uh, in every village he went to in remote areas, everyone assured him that he would be murdered and robbed in the next village he went to. And so he would go to the next village and they would say, oh, the next village you're going to come to, you'll be murdered and robbed. And he found that in fact, people were very welcoming and very uh, warm and very helpful on his whole journey. Uh, he rode solo. Uh, when he first started out, he probably had 500 pounds of extra gear, including black tie dinner jackets and all sorts of crazy things because he imagined dinners at embassies and fancy events and by the time he got to Istanbul he had shed all that and he pared down his equipment to the minimum he was probably the first to realize the axiom you know when you're when you're traveling pack it throw away half and he certainly did that his motorcycle is in original condition as he rode it in 1932-33. And it's a very rare motorcycle. The Douglas Mastiff is a 750cc. Uh, they made, I think, six of these. Uh, incredibly rare, and it was actually a gift from the Douglas Company. Fulton was sitting at a dinner party, a fancy dinner party in London, and out of the blue said, I want to ride around the world on a motorcycle. Well, it happened that one of the dinner guests was in the family that owned the Douglas factory. And he said, well, we can supply you with a motorcycle. <laughs> and the gauntlet was down. And he basically followed through on his promise for a remarkable story. This is a 1903 California. It's an incredibly rare motorcycle. It was built in San Francisco. And it's an example of the first motorcycle or motor vehicle of any kind that was ridden across the United States. George Wyman rode a motorcycle exactly like this uh, from San Francisco to New York. It took him about 52 days. Uh, he documented the journey in magazines along the way, and it was incredibly hard because really no roads existed for a long stretch between Sacramento and Chicago. Uh, reading his accounts, it's horrendous. He had to ca actually physically carry this over some mountain ranges. Uh, the engine is quite simple, uh, but he ultimately made it. Uh, unfortunately, three weeks later, the first car went across the country and that really captivated everyone's attention and his exploits were forgotten for many decades. But now there's a whole society dedicated to research into George Wyman and we're super happy to have an example of this ultra, ultra rare California motorcycle. I know this car doesn't look like much, but it's actually a really important piece of Honda history. Uh, this is the first Honda factory race car in North America. It's an N600, which was their first exported production car. And the factory worked with uh, Dave Eakins, who was the first to make a timed run down Baja on a motorcycle in 1962. Well, a few years later, in 1970, Honda teamed up with Eakins again and Bill Robinson Jr., who was his partner on the motorcycle journey, to try competing in the Baja 1000 in this car. Uh, it has a highly tuned motor, uh, it has uh, raised suspension, but the suspension was uh, the bugbear of this vehicle because it basically uh, buckled uh, over some of the extreme bumps uh, riding through the, the desert south of Tijuana. It only did about 80 miles it was largely forgotten for decades, and it was discovered in a garage in Seattle by a fellow named Tim Mings, who specializes in the N600. And for him, this is like, this is the Ne Plus Ultra. It's the, one of the most important cars in Honda racing history, and I absolutely love that it's in its original rally condition. <laughs> I love the story of Terry the Triumph. This is a bike that Julian Heppichausen rode in the Baja 1000. And believe it or not, as much as we think of triumphs in Baja and in the Baja race, this is actually, I think, the first triumph that actually won its class in the Baja 1000. Uh, that was just a few years ago in 2018. 
It's a 650 Triumph Bonneville that's been specially modified for off-road racing. racing. The Triumph is named for Terry Pratt, who was a motorcycle industry legend. He was connected with Cycle News for decades, and Terry actually originally built this bike in this configuration, and in homage, Julian named it Terry and uh, did a terrific job. He said Terry did a perfect job assembling the bike. It was completely reliable, and he won his class. Great to curate an exhibit and to be able to include your own motorcycle. This is my 1964 Honda CL72 Scrambler. It's an example of the bike that Dave Eakins and Bill Robinson Jr. rode on the first ever timed run down the length of Baja, 900 miles, from Tijuana to La Paz in 1962. It was a factory Honda supported effort to uh, give a little publicity to this new model, the Scrambler, which became incredibly popular. I think they sold 80,000 of them. Uh, and unfortunately, Dave's original bike and Bill Robinson Jr.'s bikes are lost to history. But I love their story so much, and I spent a lot of time in Baja, that I found an early example of the Honda Scrambler and took it to my house down in southern Baja. So all that dirt you see <laughs> and all that patina is genuine Baja dirt. It's as close as we can get to Dave and Bill's winning, uh, timed bikes, uh, and it's fun to be here. <laughs> This is Lyndon Poskett's Round the World KTM. It's a 2000 KTM rally race replica. And uh, instead of using one of their more traditional overland uh, offerings, they do make Enduros for long distance travel. He chose a racing motorcycle and modified it appropriately for a longer round the world trip. He's done about 60,000 miles on this bike. And interestingly, in every continent he went through, he found an overland or long distance race to participate on this bike. And people would ask him if he was doing a race in Asia, I said, well, how did you get here? And he says, well, I rode here. <laughs> the story is remarkable. And Lyndon Poskett is a remarkable ind individual. Uh, this is Big Ole. It's probably the most famous Baja racer ever. It was driven by Parnelli Jones. Uh, and he won the Baja 1000 outright several years in a row. And it's actually, uh, it's based on a Ford Bronco, but there's very little Bronco left. It's kind of the first funny car off-road racer. It's got a tubular space frame. Uh, it's got a very highly tuned Ford engine and the suspension, everything is completely one off. The only thing that's Bronco about it is the bodywork is in the style of a Bronco. It's a mix of fiberglass and aluminum and they needed a roof for the sun so they used a wing, which was the first use of a wing on an off-road endurance racer like this. It's a fabulous, super compelling vehicle. You'll love the patina about it. Uh, it was so fast. It was a handful down in the desert and uh, we're really grateful to have it. It recently sold at auction for, I think, $1.3 million. So the gold paint is literal. <laughs> it's the golden vehicle, quite fun. This is a 1915 Harley Davidson with sidecar. It's an example of what Effie and Ava Hotchkiss rode across the United States. They were the first women to ride a motorcycle across the States in 1915. Uh, Ava Hotchkiss wanted to visit the Panama Pacific Exposition in San Francisco, which opened in 1915. So in she purchased a brand new Harley Davidson. She put her mother in the sidecar and away they went. Uh, there were very few roads in much of the country at the time, and they had quite an arduous journey, but uh, Effie was an incredible mechanic and was able to maintain her vehicle and change the flat tires and everything that happened along the way. And when they arrived in San Francisco, they carried a jar of Atlantic Ocean water with them and poured it in the uh, Pacific Ocean. There's a very famous photograph we don't know where the original bike is, so we have an example of an identical uh, configuration here, just to show you what you would be traveling with in 1915. No suspension, effectively, and a very simple motorcycle, but also a very reliable motorcycle. This remarkable 1912 Henderson is an example of what Carl Stearns Clancy rode around the world in 1912 and 1913. He was the first motorcyclist to ride around the world. Uh, he documented it in his journals and in magazines. And uh, although his, the book about him was only published from his journals in the 2000s. Uh, this is an incredibly rare motorcycle. The 1912 was the first year of production for the Henderson. 
Nobody knows whether uh, he was sponsored by Henderson in the journey because it was a very expensive motorcycle, but uh, they proved to be incredibly reliable. Not only did he make his round the world journey, today uh, Henderson motorcycles are used in long distance endurance events like the motorcycle cannonball still and are typically finishers at the end. They may seem fragile and awkward, but actually these are incredibly well built and they have the nickname of the Duesenberg of motorcycles. So it's an incredible homage to Carl Stearns Clancy. What a brave man to go around the world solo in 1912. This BMW is an example of what Elspeth Beard rode around the world in 1980. Uh, she wrote a wonderful book called Lone Rider and uh, is still active today, still has her machine. Uh, we could have borrowed her original machine, but she restored it after uh, she rode it around the world and threw away her incredible saddlebags. So we went to the trouble of finding an identical machine and building uh, saddlebags that are identical. We've yet to sticker them up to make them perfect, and we've yet to get Elspeth here to sign it because she wrote a lot of personal notes all over her saddlebags uh, on her round the world journey. It's a beautiful story. It's probably the most intimate uh, story of round the world travel and long distance solo travel in general, her book. Uh, and uh, I'll stop for a second. Uh, where should I go? Uh, all right. Uh, I'd say Elspeth Beard's book, uh, Lone Rider, is the most intimate account of what happens inside when you're going for months and months on the road solo and the people you encounter or perhaps hook up with. She did fall in love twice on her journey. It's a wonderful uh, story and we're super proud to have her permission to replicate her vehicle for this exhibit. This 2002 BMW GS is a great example of how BMW changed the game on adventure travel. They basically invented the adventure motorcycle category in 1980 with the introduction of their GS series, the R80 GS. Well, this is the 2002 evolution of that, and it's the bike on which Jason Grott rode around the world. Jason didn't plan on riding around the world. He was actually working in Holland at the time uh, in tech, and he wanted to go on vacation to Turkey. So he started riding to Turkey and he didn't stop for two years. He uh, went all through Asia. He actually met his future wife in Thailand. She joined him again in Australia and again in South America. He traversed the full length of the Americas on this machine. And it shows a few scars as one might expect after all those tens of thousands and years of hard miles. But this is an example of what one would have ridden in the 2000s if one wanted to go around the world. Who would think of riding a chopper around the world? Well, Doug Wathke did. He's known as Round the World Doug, and he's ridden around the world four or five times on inappropriate machinery <laughs> like this rigid framed extended girder fork chopper. It's a 1950 Harley Davidson panhead that he built himself most of the parts are stock, although the steering head was raked and it extended forks included. And you can see it's as he rode it around the world in, I believe, 2006. And uh, he has remarkable photos and stories. <laughs> and can you imagine months and months of travel on this machine? But he did it. He's uh, a remarkable individual and uh, it's a remarkable motorcycle. This is a brand new pre-production 2021 Harley Davidson Pan America. This is Harley's first foray into the adventure motorcycle category. And uh, Harley Davidson is a sponsor of the exhibit. And we wanted to include an example of their brave move into new terrain. They're known as producers of cruisers for an older set. And they realize, of course, that they need a younger demographic and the adventure category is probably the hottest selling motorcycle category right now. All manufacturers are producing them. So Harley Davidson created a completely new engine uh, and a totally new chassis for this machine. Incredibly high tech suspension. Uh, we did a little test riding on it in the Mojave Desert uh, with the rider Dan Green and there's a film about it on our website and on the Peterson website uh, you can watch. It's terrific quite a compelling vehicle.
This is another one of Doug Wofke's incredible, inappropriate round the world motorcycles. I say inappropriate only because it's not one, one, what one would expect to ride around the world in the 2000s. But there you go. In 2006, on his uh, first round the world journey, he chose to use a 1948 Indian Chief. Uh, it's a beautiful motorcycle. You can see it's exactly how he rode it here. And, uh, he had quite a journey and he said it actually really helped that he was riding not only a classic antique but also such a beautiful motorcycle that everyone who saw it wanted to have a photograph. If he ever had any problems with it, they were more than willing to provide help. As you can imagine, it's not easy to find 60-year-old Indian parts <laughs> when you're in Mongolia, but he found lots of help in machine shops. It's a, it's a terrific journey that we document on thevintagent.com on the story about Doug, round the world Doug's incredible adventures. So this is the future of overlanding. This is the 2019 Harley-Davidson Livewire that Charlie Borman rode from Tierra del Fuego to Los Angeles. That was his uh, film series, The Long Way Up. Of course, Charlie and Ewan McGregor are well known for their round the world exploits on various machines. They chose to uh, look towards the future by using an electric vehicle uh, it was an incredible journey. They uh, used Rivian electric trucks as backup, and uh, the biggest drama was finding power in some countries, <laughs> which had irregular power supplies, but they made it. And it's a beautiful story. You can see it on TV, long way up. And we're super glad to have the actual bike that Charlie rode on his adventure. Wanted to include examples of science fiction overland vehicles in Adventure Overland to discuss the ways people think about overland travel in stories and films. So we've got this incredible uh, chariot, they called it, from the second Lost in Space series that was produced in 2019. Uh, it's a very imaginary uh, and very brutalist looking overland vehicle. Uh, of course, it's not airtight or anything like that, so there's lots of liberties taken in science fiction. If you contrast these to the actual overland vehicles, you see that, you know, of course, none of this is possible, but it makes for great sci-fi, and it's a beautifully designed truck. So of all the incredible vehicles in Adventure Overland, this one, I think, is my favorite because as a kid, I watched the TV series Lost in Space, and I loved this chariot with its incredible ski chic glazed cabin on top of a snowcat uh, chassis. This is what people thought space travel and space exploration was going to look like. As you know, we began to actually explore space, although this was before, of course, we actually landed on the moon and had an idea of what a forbidding process and what forbidding conditions actually exist on other planets. Uh, we've actually got the original robot inside the, the chariot. It's a wonderful machine. This is a replica because the original is in terrible condition. Uh, but Jeff Dunham owns this now, and we're super happy to have it because it's so much fun, and it really compels you to look and think about uh, overland travel, off-world adventure, and, of course, the Lost in Space TV show is a lot of fun. Thanks for joining me on a tour of the Adventure Overland exhibit in the Richard Varner Gallery at the Peterson Museum. The exhibit was put together by the Motorcycle Arts Foundation and Sasha Cherevkov. It was also sponsored by Harley Davidson. And uh, a lot of the hard work on the back end was done by my team at Vintagent Lab. You can read more about this and see films that we've made about the exhibit on the Peterson uh, website and also on the vintagent.com where we have full stories of every one of these adventures with photographs and films from even from the 1920s and 30s. It's pretty remarkable so check it out. Thank you everybody for watching. Be sure and hit the like button and subscribe.